Perfect. Great to be in Italy. I just flew in from California. And I want to thank uh, Pier Luigi, uh, his daughter, uh, the staff uh, of Eurotas for their very warm welcome. We've been staying at a very beautiful retreat center just north, and it is very good to be here. I would like to start my remarks by inviting you to look at this slide and just take a minute and reflect on the implications of our world. Because as we say in the United States, we ain't in Kansas anymore. We are in a completely new world. And it is our capacity to understand the world that we have now entered that determines virtually everything about our future. If you go to the top right-hand corner where you see that U, that's where we are. And for the last 10,000 years of human civilizational history, we have gone along within the realms of normalcy. And within the last 50 years, all the vectors in human society, in our environment, are going virtually straight up. So we, as we sit here today, and we talk about transpersonal and humanistic issues, we need to understand that the context in which we are now living our lives and our young people as they face the future will live their lives is a world of hyper complexity. And I'd like to make a few observations about hyper complexity because it will shape the coming years and decades on our planet. The first is that all these vectors that you see are all coming together. And what that means is that small events anywhere can have major effects everywhere as they ricochet through the global system. There are negative small events and there are positive small events. So hyper complexity is both negative and positive. So whether you're talking about the Ebola virus in West Africa or ISIS militants in the Middle East or drought in California where I come from or positive effects like the Arab Spring a couple of years ago, the young girl Malala who received the Nobel Peace Prize for her courage in the face of extremism in Pakistan. All these small effects now are global. The other observation that I would make is that this is happening within an acceleration of time. Things are getting worse and worse, better and better, faster and faster. And we have now entered what Irvin Laszlo calls the chaos zone. And virtually all of us 
are unprepared. Our governments are not dealing with hypercomplexity. Our civic institutions are not dealing with hypercomplexity. And therefore, the world system, both for good and for ill, is literally spinning out of control. One of the other observations that I would make is that this is a recognized global phenomenon. IBM did two studies in 2010 and 2012 in which they interviewed 1,700 CEOs and 3,600 young people in 60 countries around the world. And the global consensus of the CEOs of the global corporations and the young people is that not only was hypercomplexity the central challenge, but our educational institutions in particular are not preparing our young people for the world that is coming. And I want to dwell on that particular aspect because of what Einstein said toward the end of his life as he surveyed the consequences of the letter that he wrote with another physicist, Leo Szilard, in 1939 to President Roosevelt suggesting that the United States develop the nuclear bomb. He said that he regretted ever sending that letter and that he wished in hindsight that he had never taken up physics at all and had remained a watchmaker because he said the lesson that he had learned is that the consciousness that produces the problem can't solve the problem. And that is a fundamental observation that I think undergirds hypercomplexity. With all the UN conferences, with all the activities of the European Parliament, the American Parliament, the Indian, Brazilian governmental systems, the world situation keeps getting more and more out of control. Why? because the consciousness that is producing the problem is trying to solve the problem. That is the predicament in which we all find ourselves. And so what my colleagues and I have been looking at over the last number of years is how do you begin the process of changing consciousness at a mass level. And the historical example that I would like to refer to uh, is the Renaissance, both because it happened here in Italy in Florence first, uh, and because it gives, I think, a very valuable lesson in the most fundamental social change in which human beings in community can engage. We tend to think that if you want to change something, you have to go into politics. And that is true if you want to change the problem with the consciousness that produced the problem. But what happened in Florence Actually, in 1402, in October of 1402, as the Milanese army had laid siege to Florence, and Florence, starving, was on the point of surrender when the major domo of Milan 
literally fell dead in one day of the bubonic plague. And as the Milanese army was retreating from Florence, there were two chancellors of Florence, city councilors, Savatati and Bruno. And they had a conversation and made a fateful decision. They determined that the situation was so bad Political change no longer was sufficient for the change that they sought. So what did they do? They changed the educational system of Florence. And they quite literally shifted the basis of education from the church and the Bible to what they called civic humanism based on the humanism of the Greco-Roman civilization and the notion not of biblical revelation, but on human reason and the scientific method. And it was that impulse in Florence to begin a completely new education for the young people of that city-state that gave rise over the next 75 years to everything that we know about the Renaissance, the artistic impulse, the creative impulse, the impulse toward innovation and discovery that not only spread across Europe over the next 150 years, but according to historians, literally gave birth to the modern world. It started with a transformation in education. And so that is the one point around how we deal with the hypercomplexity and how we begin to prepare our young people for the future that is coming that in the few minutes I have, I would like to explore. And uh, let me see if I can find the, I'm not used to an IBM here, uh, but I need the next slide. Yeah, the, yeah there we go. So if you're going to change the educational system and really design it to catalyze a transformation of education. You need to do what the Florentines did. You need to actually shift the basis of education away in our case, in our time, in the 21st century, away from the scientific materialism that now has all of our civic institutions, our political institutions, our educational institutions in a vice grip. The orthodoxy of science today is more powerful than the Pope and the church before the Renaissance. You cannot get a job at any university unless you buy into the prevailing orthodoxy controlled by scientific materialism. Much I could say about this, but because of the brevity of time, I would make just the one point that what we are seeking to do in a university that we are building with Pier Luigi and partners all over the world called Ubiquity University is shifting the basis of the educational experience itself away from scientific materialism to what we call the living universe. The notion that all of life is interconnected, it's alive, it's intelligent, it's transpersonal, and it can mediate transformation simply by recognizing its aliveness. Our next speaker is going to talk about sacred plants. That's one example 
of when you recognize the aliveness of the world around you, transformation naturally ensues. The other point that I would make about uh, the university that we're forming, and I believe whether it's Ubiquity University, it should be any university or any system, it needs to be integral. Hyper-complexity, where small events anywhere can have major events everywhere, requires a framework that honors all the bits of data from every part of the system. And that, of course, is the limitation of the scientific materialist method. If you can't measure it in a test tube, it's not considered real. But you have emotional intelligence. You have spiritual intelligence. You have all kinds of interior ways of knowing. You know with your gut. But it's very hard to measure in a test tube. But it is a way of knowing. And that's why Ken Wilbur is the chancellor of Ubiquity University, because we have adopted an integral approach, which, as you may know, brings all the different ways a human being knows and activates it. So if you have a learning system that is integral in scope, that is founded on the bedrock of a living universe, you activate all the different kinds of intelligences that people have. One of our advisors is a professor at Harvard uh, called Howard Gardner, and he wrote the seminal book on multiple intelligences 20 years ago as a critique of Harvard education where he said Harvard education only addresses really three different intelligences, the scientific empirical, the analytical, and the mathematical. can inform their analytical intelligence, spiritual intelligence, as some of the young people were saying in the panel just before us, can inform their mathematics, their empirical. So there's a connection, I believe, between hyper-complexity and an integral framework that activates all the different intelligences that people have. And the result that when people go through this integral learning system and they come to the reality that human life is being lived and breathed within a larger living system, all of a sudden their highest performance is activated why is that important? It's important because given the world that is coming, the hyper-complexity, the increasing hyper-complexity, if you don't, if you're not engaging with everything that you have, if you're not meeting hyper-complexity in an integral way, in a way that activates your high performance, you're probably going to become a catastrophe. Because things are going to become a lot worse before they get better, particularly in terms of the issue of climate change. I come from California, as I indicated. We have 60 million people in California. We're in the fifth year of the worst drought 
in recorded history. And NASA scientists are now saying to Californians, the Golden State, you are going to run out of water in the next year, maybe two years. What do 60 million people do when there's no water? They're going to move. They're going to migrate. In the news just yesterday, it said there are more people migrating around the world today, 65 million people, than at any time in recorded history. So hyper-complexity is a reality. And so the activation of everything that we can possibly be as, our, as human beings in the face of it has become not only a historical challenge of unprecedented proportions, but a personal challenge in terms of how we, and especially our young people, navigate through an increasingly complex world. I have two sons in their early 20s. I'm watching them go through the current educational system and be totally unprepared for the future that is coming. Scientists are saying that if we do not radically change our consciousness, radically shift from fossil fuel to alternative and clean technology and energy, that by the year 2100, 85 years from today, that upwards of 80% of the human race will have been killed off by disease, by war, and by the escalating effects of climate change. So when we're talking about a new educational system, as we seek to prepare our young people for the world that is coming, it is not an idealistic fantasy of what we should actually do. It is a matter of global necessity. And so at Ubiquity University, we are building an integral learning system, a whole new operating system. We're establishing a network of light centers, centers like Pier Luigi's school here in Italy, the retreat center where we're staying uh, for the balance of our conference, uh, a network. Because as we move into the future, there are a, a number of, of characteristics of how people of goodwill can comport themselves. The first is to understand what Paul Ray, the sociologist, has observed has been happening in Western Europe in particular and the United States over the last 50 years. And that is that even though we think as we come together in our small numbers at conferences like this that there isn't very much going on and the prevailing institutions aren't listening to us, the fact is that people are listening to us much more than we think. And the statistics of the research that has been conducted in North America, in Europe, including here in Italy, is that roughly 30%, the 35% of the populations now understand that a completely new way of, of being with each other and dealing with the challenges that are coming our way 
is required. This is the phenomenon of the cultural creatives. And it seems almost impossible when you look at politics in Italy or politics in the EU, or certainly politics in the United States. But we all can take great confidence that there are more of us now as a single value proposition, as a cultural, creative value proposition, a, a transpersonal a value proposition, than even the conservatives in our respective country. The problem is that because we do not see this new value system on the television, in our political parties, in our civic institutions, in our government leaders, we don't see it refracted back to us. We all think we're alone, but we're not. And the other observation that I would make is that the most extraordinary thing is true about this emerging coalition of cultural creatives is that it's a global phenomenon. It didn't pop up in one place and spread. It happened to ignite all over virtually simultaneously. So there is more of a similarity between a cultural creative in Milan and a cultural creative in Tokyo and San Francisco than there is between a Melanese cultural creative and his or her neighbor that is not. So it's a, it's a, it's a global phenomenon within the context of which Isolation seems to be a reality, a perception, but the underlying truth is that we're the largest single value system now in the global north and in cosmopolitan cities all over the world. So let me conclude by making the observation that Martin Luther King made many years ago in the civil rights movement, but which I believe is applicable to our situation now. And that is, he said, we face the fierce urgency of now. And the fierce urgency of now is that our world of hyper complexity is moving into escalating chaos and little events everywhere ricochet through this global system and have major effects. The situation is getting worse and worse, better and better, faster and faster. So what that means is the fact that you are here today. I am here today. We are gathered together has a global capacity for influence and change. Everything now is intercollected. And so let me conclude with a poem from Reiner Maria Rilke. He wrote a very short poem that has impacted me since I first read it, in which he says, time and again in history, some special people wake up. They have no ground in the crowd. They move to broader laws. They carry strange customs with them. 
and demand room for bold and audacious action. The future speaks ruthlessly through them. They change the world. Time and again in history, some special people wake up. That's us. We're waking up. That's why we're here. And we're becoming what I call 13s in a 12 world. We have no ground in the crowd. We move to broader laws. We carry strange customs with us, especially if you take the sacred plants. And we demand room for bold and audacious action. The future speaks ruthlessly through us. And that's why we can change the world. Thank you.